Welcome traders to today's session uh, where we are going to be discussing the impact of the geopolitical events on futures markets and we're also going to be looking at how we can utilize a unique trading tool uh, provided by Bookmap to better inform our trading decisions. So once again welcome to the presentation just going to give it another 10 or 15 seconds here to allow people to uh, to log on. So my name is Patrick Munley. I've been trading for over 15 years. I'm a money manager and mentor. I'm also resident market expert, providing exclusive market and trade analysis to Ticknell clients. I also run the Ticknell Futures Trading Strategy Group. Today, I'll be acting as your host for this event. So feel free to message me any questions you may have regarding the topics being discussed. You can pop those into the chat. At the end of the session, we are going to open up a Q&A. Uh, where we will cover off all the questions that you have. So, uh, so once again, I do encourage you to just drop the questions into the chat box and I'll be moderating that. Uh, today, industry veteran and trading legend Dan Gramza is going to be presenting and walking you through his perspective on the developing implications uh, of the current geopolitical landscape and specifically the ongoing Ukraine crisis. He will also introduce you to his unique behavioral Japanese candlestick analysis for the futures markets. He's then gonna pass the baton on to Bruce Pringle. Bruce is a professional trader with over 10 years of experience, and he is also the chief education officer for Bookmac. Bookmac is a unique trading platform that provides traders with a visual presentation of order flow and market liquidity. These tools, like I say, are designed to help support and help traders really make better trading decisions by understanding the depth of liquidity in the market, the purpose of today's session is really to provide you with some actionable analysis. Our intention today is to work from the macro to the micro, discussing potential trading opportunities. And at the end of the presentation, like I say, we will open up a forum for Q&A. And finally, we'll wrap up the session today with a very generous offer from Ticknell. And I will explain how you can get complimentary six-month access to the Bookmap platform at the end of the session. So... Let me pass you over to Dan, and uh, we should be able to see his screen. I just want to make sure that everyone can do that. So if you can see Dan's screen, and uh, if you can just type into the chat box a why, that would uh, that be very helpful. Uh, one second, I just need to open the chat box. Uh, there we go. So if you can type a why in the chat box, if you can see Dan's screen, thank you very much. Dan, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you. What an exciting time in the markets. We have a lot to talk about today. So let's get started. Uh, what I'm sharing with you today, I just want to let you know, is general information. It's, uh, you know, Tickmill. I'm not affiliated with Tickmill or the CME group. They're not endorsing anything I'm going to share with you. Uh, these are ideas that I found helpful, and I hope you do too. Uh, as Patrick said, my background comes from the trading floors here in Chicago. That's where my ideas and concepts kind of got formulated. And it's uh, through a word of mouth network. I have to tell oh, you, I've, awesome. I've had the chance to work with over 400 and some different exchanges. I mean, uh, institutions around the globe. Oh, Typically I would circle the globe a couple of times a year, but uh, over the last couple of years with the oh. pandemic, I haven't. But oh, what's interesting about oh, it is wow. what it does show me about how markets are reacted to by different institutions in different parts of the world. Uh, their attitude work towards risk can be different, but you know, also the commonality that we all face as someone who exposes capital to risk, to risk in the markets. Uh, to, and again, to give you a quick idea, I'm gonna go over some of the economic issues we're gonna talk about behavioral candles. I got some live markets for us to take a look at. And then Bruce is gonna take us through the exciting world of book map. So let's get started. Now, when it comes to crude oil, about a hundred countries produce crude oil. 
In 2020, five countries produced 50% of the total world production, United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Canada. Now the top three, United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are the only ones that can produce in double digits. So in other words, produce more than 10 million barrels a day. Uh, the United States in 2019 was close to 13 million barrels a day. Russia right now, uh, I think is around 10 million and so is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia does have some room to the upside, but we get conflicting results on this in terms of capacity, but we talk more about that later. Globally, the world consumes about 100 million barrels a day. If you can think about all the production the world does, I think of it going into one gigantic barrel. And out of that gigantic barrel of oil, the United States consumes about 19 to 20 million barrels per day. Uh, that's been typical for the last few years for, this, uh, for that country, for our country here. Uh, U.S. produces about 10 to 13 million barrels per day. So we do import. Well, where does that come from? Well, if you look at the top eight, in terms of where we buy crude oil. I want you to focus really on the top two here for a minute. Canada and Mexico, our friends in Canada, we do more with them than any other country by far. You know, 56% here is what it's showing. Oftentimes it's over 60%. Uh, they have tar sands uh, that they uh, have a little trouble refining because it's not easy to refine. Uh, the United States has the capabilities of refining that. So that comes down to us. So we do buy that crude oil from them. Mexico has heavy sour crude and it's also difficult to refine. We have refining capabilities in the Gulf Coast that take care of that. So what we'll do is we'll buy that how, uh, heavy sour crude refine it and sell product back to them. We can also sell those countries light sweet crude, uh, which they can also process. So that's that relationship. By the way, we, a lot of people think we get most of our crude oil from other countries. Uh, these are the primary ones, but let's take a look at Russia. You know, 1.7% of our imports, and it's obviously changing right now is our relationship with them has changed because of their invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, let's talk about export though. Now, remember Canada and Mexico? Check this out. The five destinations that we send crude oil to, well, Mexico and Canada. Not surprising based upon the types of crudes that we're talking about and the relationship we have with those countries. But here's what else it means. It means that for us to buy that crude oil from Canada, we, can, we need Canadian dollars. And for us to buy Mexican uh, crude, well, we need pesos. So this also has an international relationship when it comes to currencies. You and I will see that when you start talking about markets. But let's go back to crude, the world's most actively traded commodity. The NYMEX division, it, by the way, that's a part of the CME group. Uh, they, the contract specs, it's a light, sweet crude oil futures contract. It's the world's most liquid form for crude oil trading the world's largest volume futures contract trading on a futures on a physical commodity contract used as an international pricing benchmark light sweet crude are preferred by refiners and here's why because if it's light it has low paraffin if it's sweet it has low sulfur if you have heavy sour as we were talking about from mexico it takes extra steps because you have a lot more paraffin and you have a lot more sulfur. So you get higher yields if you have light, sweet crude. So gasoline, diesel fuel, heating oil, your yields are higher if you have a light, sweet crude. And that's preferred by many refiners. But light, sweet crude refiners cannot necessarily refine heavy sour crudes because of extra steps that's in the process that they may not be set up for. 
here's just one thing I do want to mention to you about this particular product. You may have already seen it, but it's a micro crude oil contract. And it started trading this year just a few months ago. Uh, micro means it's one tenth the size of the full size contract. It means that your margin requirement for this market could be a few hundred dollars, not a few thousand dollars. So your capital requirement goes down, your exposure per tick goes down. But here's what fascinates me. And what you're looking at in the micro in the other full size contract, uh, this is not an issue because it is a globally traded market. But here's what fascinates me, it's this. Just a couple months later, they were trading almost 20, now they're over 20 million contracts. And 40% of the volume comes from outside the United States. That is a comfort. That means if I'm working an order at night when I'm sleeping, there's somebody else out there trading it. So for us, for any of us, no matter what time zone you're in, there is somebody out there also looking at this market. So liquidity comes into play. Now let's talk about Russia, the invasion of Ukraine, the economic impact. The EU market for fossil fuel supplies most of Moscow's foreign income, or at least it did. Crude oil at $70 a barrel, just for your reference, made Russia $120 billion. And we're trading above that right now. So it is a key source of revenue for them. Oil to much of Europe is being cut, as you know. Crude is instead flowing to Asia, where India has become the top buyer, followed by China. Moscow is selling crude at deep discounts at 30 to $35 a barrel. So if you're India, you got 1.4 billion people to take care of. You can buy crude oil at that discount. You have an existing relationship already. Um, so for that to expand, not surprising. Here's an example of that expansion. India imported 12 million barrels of Russian oil in 21. This year, so far, 60 million barrels. So they've increased by five times just this year in terms of their input. So is R Russia losing income stream to Europe? Yes. Is it changing? Yes. So we're seeing an example of that kind of behavior. India is a refining hub. They can send out refined products with strong margin now. Their profitability goes up. In May, some 30 Russian crude tankers went to India, unloading 430,000 barrels per day versus 60,000 barrels per day in just January and March of this year. So we're seeing dramatic changes there. Sri Lanka bought 99,000 ton shipment from Russian crude, and they only have one refinery to get that thing going. Turkey is another key destination for Russian crude. Uh, and there's some pipelines here we're going to take a look at. Chinese state-owned and independent refiners, they've also stepped up their purchases from Russia. In 2021, China was the largest single buyer of Russian oil, taking 1.6 million barrels per day on average, equally divided between pipeline and seaborne routes. Now let's talk about nat gas. That's another major issue. So who does Russia export gas to? Well, the primary customer in Europe is Germany. Then you can see here we got Italy, Belarus, Turkey, Netherlands, Hungary. Hungary pushed back on making any changes to nat gas from Russia because it is critical for their economy. That attitude's changed a little bit. Orban's kind of rethought that, I think. But so this is where it typically flowed in, you know, just a couple of years ago. That is changing. And what, what is that economic impact? What has it done? And if anybody here is in Europe, uh, one of the things you've seen is the increase in prices or maybe not seen, but felt. What we were paying $6 for, $5 for, they were paying at that point in time in this year now, over $60, 10 times more. And right now where we are, you know, that's four times. We're, we're around $6, $7 as we're going to see. They're paying over 40 And Asia's right up there with them. So it really had a tremendous impact on the cost 
of not well, a whole variety of things. And we're going to talk about what that is. One of them is right here. It's electricity. Look at these charts. You see vertical moves in each one of these for Germany, France, Italy. The cost of electricity is taken off. So many countries switched to nat gas because it burns 60% cleaner than coal. The prices were cheap and it was an economical thing to do. In the United States, we produce more electricity with natural gas than we do with coal now. And let's talk about how they move it. Because natural gas isn't something that's easy to move. Crude oil is far easier. You know, it is a gas. So to get it in a liquid form, you got to squeeze it. You got to put it under pressure to slow down the molecules. And then they get it very cold and it transforms into uh, a liquid. The things that you hear so much about, I just want to point out two things to you so that uh, when you hear about them, you'll get an idea of what they're referring to. And that's right up here. Nord Stream 2, we heard so much about that. They completed it from Russia to Germany, but it was not accepted by Germany. So that's empty. And here's Nord Stream 1, that tan line. Uh, that one was shut down on Monday for 10 days of maintenance. A lot of people are concerned, are they gonna turn it back on? Remember though, for them to leave it off, that's income to them as well. And uh, so I don't know how aggressive they're gonna be on that, but we'll see. All right, now let's talk about wheat. Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat, United States number two, Canada, France is the largest exporter or producer of wheat uh, in Europe. And then we see the Ukraine. This is also a critical area. Russia is the world's largest exporter with more than 18% of global exports. Ukraine and Russia together, 30%. Countries at risk are Egypt. More than 70% of Egypt's imported wheat, you know, comes from this region. And you remember the Arab Spring? Well, that started with the price of a loaf of our flatbread, actually. So it is a big deal. It's a, politically, it's a very big deal. And for the people who live there, India, Indonesia, Turkey, they rely on the Ukraine and Russia wheat to make flatbread, nat gas, and tourism. About 50% of the grain for the World Food Program buys, buys to feed 125 million people worldwide comes from Ukraine. 78% of Turkey's imports come from Russia, 9% from Ukraine. And wheat is used in Turkey's food industry. Processed food is a major Turkish export. Uh, sanctions imposed on Russia means harvested and stored wheat isn't being bought, that's changing. But for Ukraine, wheat harvested and stored from last season, it won't be shipped. Or what they're trying to do is come up with their some other alternatives. The seaports have been closed. And farmers in some areas that they have carryover from last year. And they're looking at ports on the Danube to export it. But here's the challenge. If some of those farmers, the cost for export, for transportation is huge. So that means when they sell that wheat, they're going to be at a loss. But yet they're forced to sell it because they need some income. So it's a very tricky situation that's happening there. What happens to that winter wheat that's currently in the ground that was planted in the autumn? And it should be harvested in this past spring, was it? Ukraine, let's talk about another market. 16% of global corn exports. Ukraine supplies 60% of the corn to the EU. If you look at this chart of different countries, the green line is production. This is all based on percent. All right, so the green line shows percentage of world uh, production of corn. And United States is one of the larger producers, as you can see there. And if you look at, you see China's really a biggie too, but you don't see any export. The blue line represents percentage of export. China consumes it all, they don't export it. But look at Brazil, look at Argentina, and look at our friends in Ukraine. Those four countries are 
critical for global supply when it comes to corn. The most common use of that corn is for animal feed. So it's for protein production is where that comes into play. Now, let's do this. Let's talk about another critical area before we finish up here. Russia is a major exporter of potash, aluminum, uh, ammonia, uh, urea, and other soil nutrients. Disrupted shipments of key fertilizer has a global impact. Russia and Belarus account for more than 40% of the global exports of potash last year one of the three critical nutrients to boost crop yields. Russia accounted for key types of fertilizer, 22% of global exports of ammonia, 14% of urea, 14% of MAP. Brazil, the world's biggest soybean exporter, but they need imported fertilizers. And when you think about it, Russia and Belarus were the source of 50% of those shipments. So some people are saying, okay, there's problems in Europe, no problem. Farmers should just plant more. Well, do I plant more if I can't fertilize it and I can't get my return on that extra investment? That's what's being faced. Ukraine and Russia supplies 75% of the global sunflower oil. That represents 10% of all cooking oil. Indonesia, the world's largest palm oil exporter, I'll show you in a minute how these come into play, but they were planning on banning exports. Then they took the ban off. They, Indonesia accounts for half of the world's supply of palm oil, the most widely used vegetable oil. It's used for cooking and production of all kinds of products. Palm oil is competing with soybean oil prices. I'll show you that in a bit. The ban was designed to bring down domestic palm oil prices because they're trying to deal with inflation, but they've opened the door a bit and we'll see the result of that when I show you that. But crops like sunflower and corn, they're planted in the spring, but who's going to plant them in the Ukraine? If you look at the south region, of, of Ukraine and the Western region, there are some farmers out there. They're also farming around uh, big craters in their fields uh, from Russian uh, ammunition. But if you look at this, who's going to do it? You got the draft going on, you got mined farms, the invasion itself, shortage of fuel and fertilizer. So it's a, uh, and transportation challenges. And we haven't felt the impact economically of this yet, of these areas. You know, Russia, second largest supplier of platinum. platinum. Uh, Ukraine supplies more than 90% of a semiconductor grade neon gas used in lasers in the US semiconductor chip manufacturing. We think we had a problem before with semiconductor chips and not being able to get cars produced and other items. Well, we haven't had totally felt this either. Russia supplies 35% of the palladium also for chips. Large impact on the European car manufacturing, Volkswagen, BMW, closed assembly lines in Germany because there's a shortage of wiring harnesses, harnesses that are manufactured in Ukraine. Tire manufacturer Michelin also announced that it's gonna close European uh, plants because of the logistics of this invasion. Last thing I wanna show you here, look at, look at the, the, this breakdown of items that come into play here. And you look at palladium and platinum, those are used to produce uh, catalytic converters. Uh, so where is that gonna be coming from? We can start feeling the pinch in that regard. And we've talked about these other areas, but I wanna point that out that I think the impact, economic impact, as we get through harvest, as we still have to deal with these transportation logistics, we're gonna see continuing impacting the market. And let's do this. Let's, let's look, well, let's do, let's finish this, I guess. I wanna tell you something about where does Russia fit in? It's 11th, the largest economy in the world. It's 1.7% of the global economy. Its GDP is around 1.5 trillion, slightly smaller than the state of Texas. Ukraine's economy is about the size of Nevada's economy and it's 33rd in the United States. 
prior to the invasion of Ukraine, total value of the Russian stock market, which was really coming back, $251 billion. And that's about equal to the market cap of PepsiCo. In 2020, 36.5 of all Russian imports and 37.9 of exports were with the EU. So it's not just crude oil and that gas that we're gonna see an impact when it comes to this. I just wanna show you quickly a tool that we're gonna be looking at today. Many of you are probably familiar with candle charts. Um, this is a, something I saw in Tokyo, teaching a course for Bank of America. Uh, in the dealing room, there was a fellow drawing these candle charts. I was there to teach a different technique. But my point is what I wanna show you is what went through my mind as a market maker thinks about market. And they draw a box between the open and the close. And if the close is above the open, that box called the body, I have it as green, traditional color is red. Uh, I consider it buying. On the other side, when the box closes below the open, I think it represents selling. When the highs and lows don't match the top and bottom of the candle, you see a vertical line. On the highs, I think it represents sellers. It's called a shadow. And on the downside, I think it represents buyers coming into the market. Now, the sizes that of the bodies represent commitment, momentum. The size of the shadows give us an idea of market acceptance or rejection. Now, let's take those ideas. And I, oh, I just want to tell you, uh, I have a website, dangramza.com. Uh, you can click on the button here, start here, and it, it's a video. That's a trading floor behind me in Chicago. Uh, and it just talks about what you'll see in the video. Then you can click on free market studies, learn more, get started. And there's a uh, click on free registration, some basic information. You're not going to hear from me unless you uh, sign up for a, a daily email that will tell you when the video is produced. It's done every day. The markets are open and you can go back. I think seven years or so, and look at previous uh, videos. I'm, I'm mentioning this because if you've never traded futures, this may be something to consider. Um, if you have trade only the stock indices, maybe you want to look at something else. So let's do this. I have one more thing here. And let's pull up some markets. Now these red and green lines are buy and sell levels from my point of view. These are not trade recommendations, uh, but it's just to give you a reference of what someone's thinking about and what you can do. Uh, for example, the dash lines are, that's a previous trade. So if you went back to, let's say July 1st, look down here at the bottom, it says July 1st. If you went back to that video for that date, then you would see this being set up. And the red line here would be a sell level. Uh, the dollar difference here, if you're not familiar with this market, is $1,000 a contract. And the next buy level here is at 38.60. Now today, because of the price action we're seeing, you know, we had PPI coming out, we had a few things that market's kind of nervous about, but we're also seeing buyers coming back in. We're seeing a bounce. And the issue is if we finish like this, uh, this green line that you see here, that's going to be lowered because how do people want to go into the weekend? That's going to be the issue also. Over here in the NASDAQ market, uh, from this previous buy level to that sell level, just to give you a reference here, uh, that difference is, um, what is it? It's uh, $4,000 down here in the Dow uh, that difference there was $650. And over in our friend, the Russell, those small to mid cap companies, this difference between the buy and sell level is um, $900. That doesn't mean much. I just wanted to give you a feel for what those represent. Let's look at the next one quickly. These are the currencies. Interesting where the Euro is. Uh, we were talking about that before we started today. You know, we've been below par before back in uh, two, early 2000, we were around 83 cents or something in that range. Um, so we have gone below that. 
to below parity. If it finishes like this, I'm going to look for an update on Friday as we go into the end. But fundamentally, has anything changed? No, there's enough uncertainty that the dollar is stronger. So when you have the dollar this strong, that means these currencies, you would expect weak, the US dollar strong, commodity prices down. That would be expected. Now, here's a Swissy. Uh, the difference between that sell level to that buy level, which happened yesterday, it traded above that. Uh, that was uh, $2,625 a contract. And uh, a couple others just to tell you about. Well, let's talk about British pound also continues weak in that market. Uh, this dollar difference in that market was uh, $812.50. Uh, but you can see they've all broken to the downside. They're still maintaining that selling pressure. You know, the Canadian dollar and our friends over here in the Aussie dollar are two interesting markets because they're resource-based economies. And we're seeing a little bit of buying coming back in. It'll be interesting to see how we finish out this week. Uh, Bitcoin, as you're probably aware, has been a little soft. Uh, over the last few months. Uh, again, you could go back to June 13th or so or 12th, and you could see what was going on here with that red line, that sell level. Uh, and a couple days ago, it traded above its buy level. Uh, the dollar difference in that market um, was $37,000 a contract. And you can see here, I want to point out to you though, this is a buy, it failed. Uh, but you notice the shadow on top, it backed off. So that one didn't cooperate. And right now it's uh, trading above its next buy level. So, and here's our uh, sell level there. But instead of doing that, I want to get through a couple others here quickly, because I want to get this over to Bruce. He's got a lot to share with you today. Uh, these are interest rate markets. You know, the 10-year the notes that you see here, uh, the dollar difference here between the buy and the sell level, again, just to give you a reference, was $2,562.50. Uh, and the difference here between this sell level and this buy level is $375. If we're in the bond market, uh, this market gave us that rally. Here's the buy level. There's your sell level in that market. Um, and that was a $2,625 a contract. I'm looking for weakness in these markets. So for Friday's action, I want to see down days. If you look at yesterday's video, I said I was looking for inside type days. We have that. Now, ideally for a close for this week, you'd want to see it down. The reason for that is that when money, what we're seeing here, what I'm showing you is how capital shifts between different sectors. So when it comes out of the stock market, it goes someplace. One of the places it goes is interest rates. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, also metals. Well, let's talk about that. What is going on here with gold? Times of uncertainty? Yeah. Uh, high inflation? Yeah. Those are motivators for this market. Gold where precious metals are what I consider a, an excuse market. And right now the US dollar, very strong, we're seeing the impact here. So from that previous sell level, this is still in a bearish condition. Over here in silver though, it traded above its bullish level. Uh, that dollar value in that market was $8,350 a contract. Over here in copper, uh, I'm looking for a potential up move here, but not as long as the doubt and uncertainty in the globe uh, stays where it is right now. China consumes 48% of global production. Watch China. Uh, and oh, the dollar difference here between that bearish and bullish levels, those dash lines uh, in that market, that was um, 8,000. No, it wasn't. $6,500 a contract. 
again, just to give you a reference. But let's, I got two things to talk about and we're gonna stop here. Uh, crude oil, and we've been talking about that, what's going on with it. Well, we're bouncing, we're below $100. I have to tell you, I think 105 to 95 is fair value in this market. So even though we're finding buyers, do we have a reason to rally at this point? I don't think we do. Uh, the dollar value difference here between that bearish to bullish level here was $5,000 a contract, just to give you that as a reference. Nat gas firming up. This is a market you'd look for it to be explosive. Uh, this action we're seeing today is not. Even though it's a green candle, I'm looking for an inside to lower if indeed we finish this way. So this red line today, that's going to be moved higher. Uh, the dollar value here in this market was three uh, between the buy and sell was three thousand five hundred dollars over here in beans. Uh, that difference between that sell to buy levels in that market uh, was five thousand dollars a contract. Uh, this is a market that I do look for further movement to the upside. There's more room there. Same thing in corn. Uh, this dollar difference in that market was. Uh, $3,150 a contract. A follow through to the upside is what I'm looking for there. And for our friend, Mr. Wheat, uh, from that bearish to bullish level in that market, that was $12,000 a contract. Uh, but right now, even though they're selling the rally, that's what those shadows tell us. Uh, on the floor, you'd see the brokers selling into that, not buying it. But if we trade above 850, you wanna see it closing around 890. So that's a few things going on in the marketplace. I mentioned to you about uh, soybean oil and soy uh, and palm oil. Here's what's going on. And you can see that this is a result of what we're seeing in Russia and Ukraine. And when, when Indonesia said, you know something, we're not gonna export palm oil, look how the market reacted. And then when they said, yeah, we'll, we'll let some of it go. We see some volatility. Uh, in these markets. Well, those are a few ideas I hope you find helpful. And Bruce, I want to turn this over to you to have you share with us the, the interesting things that's going on with Bookmap. And I'm going to stop sharing here so we can get back to this and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Dan. Uh, really interesting uh, uh, presentation there on the uh, on the fundamental outlook here, uh, and uh, and thank you, Patrick, for hosting this event and the opportunity to uh, to present here. Um, so, uh, looking at Bookmap here, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes, I can okay. see. Okay. Okay. Great. And uh, let's see. Um, all right. Well, first off, uh, you know, for a lot of traders, when uh, they look at Bookmap here, uh, they're very confused uh, and there's a lot of information on the chart here. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, I understand that uh, that uh, uh, it looks very uh, uh, complex. It's actually not complex. It's quite the opposite. And I'm just going to give a quick overview so uh, everybody uh, understands what they're looking at here. Uh, we don't have time to, to, to dig in uh, too deep here because I want to go through uh, some of the markets that uh, Dan was covering. Uh, and then take a look at what's inside the candles uh, to see not only the transactions and the market structure, but to also see the liquidity. Where are they buying and selling? Uh, for example, we'll come back and revisit this, but look at the parity here uh, in the euro dollar. Uh, right down at $1, uh, tons of liquidity. Uh, and, uh, and it starts to trade into it. Uh, but look, at you can even see more in the heat map, and we'll go over it in just a minute. Uh, but they're adding more contracts here. There's more buyers here. Uh, so understanding this information, uh, where the buyers are lined up to deal, uh, gives you a lot of insight uh, to where price might go next. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, yeah, let's uh, let's start maybe with the uh, euro dollar. That's fine. Uh, we'll uh, go over what you're looking at here now. In the sub chart here, we have um, the. Uh, uh, stops and icebergs that actually we can uh, access. Uh, it's an add-on, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to close that up actually for right now, uh, and then we're going to look at um, just these three elements on the chart. 
uh, that uh, a book map is displaying. There's only three uh, and uh, very, very simple and straightforward data here. In fact, a candlestick chart with a few indicators is more complex in theory uh, than what you're looking at here in book map. Uh, so uh, let's take the heat map off to begin with. Uh, and uh, now we're just looking at two elements uh, plus the candles. Uh, and uh, in fact, let's take the candles off. Uh, now we're just looking at the transactions with the red dot is a market sell order. Uh, green dot is a market buy order. This is the aggressor uh, volume that you're looking at. Uh, the um, uh, size of the dot and the color give you uh, insight to how much traded uh, in a graphical representation here. The bigger dot is more sell transactions uh, and smaller is uh, uh, less uh, transactions. So less buys here, uh, more buys down here at the bottom. Uh, and um, yeah, so let's uh, uh, take off the volume dots. And now we're just looking at one very simple uh, element. It's just best bid and offer. Uh, that alone uh, will give you some insight here. Uh, some really nice stuff just looking at best bid and offer here. Uh, look at the breakdown here and look at the breakout here right at the same area uh, and seems to be accepting above it. Uh, so just understanding market structure uh, via uh, best bid and offer. Uh, so uh, it's giving you all of the price action. So a candlestick, uh, it does not give you all the price action. It, it gives you aggregated data within a period. Uh, and then Dan uh, is expertly reading the, uh, uh, these periods here uh, and putting together uh, uh, where price might go based on uh, reading these candlesticks and understanding uh, the context here uh, of, the, of the market action. So um, the, uh, the, the details though, like this drop, consolidation, and then it dropped again, and it kind of slowed down as it dropped down here. Uh, and then as Dan was uh, uh, pointing out, the wick, okay, this is buying pressure. Well, let's take a look and add a second element on here, which is the volume, the transactions from the aggressor, okay? So sellers on the way down, quite a bit of buying here uh, at the very, very bottom. Uh, and then you can see uh, not, not a whole lot on the way back up. We get sellers come in for another uh, uh, barrage lower here, uh, some back and forth in here, but mostly buying. And we get buyers back up here. And then at the top here, at this swing, we're getting more buyers. So looking for it to come back up and test into these areas here, just by looking at best bid and offer uh, and, uh, and the volume. Uh, and then we can see the, the, the breakout above that area here. There's going to be a lot of stops um, uh, triggered above that area as well. Uh, so anyway, uh, just two elements here. Uh, and then the third element, though, is the heat map. This is going to show you the other side of the trade. Who's on the other side? It's from the order book. So if we look at the current market right here, everything to the right of the vertical white line here uh, is current best bid and offer, last traded volume, our price ladder, and the COB column stands for current order book. So what you're looking at here uh, is the an amount of contracts. These are limit sell orders above the market and limit buy orders down below. You have the numerical values in a histogram in here. If we zoom in a little bit, I'll show you. Uh, and so you can see the liquidity. This, this is the, the auction here right now. Uh, and we can see that they're always adding and pulling liquidity uh, from the market. And this is where you find your buyers and sellers. All we're doing in Bookmap is taking that liquidity and transforming it graphically. So areas of high liquidity, 62 contracts or 96 down here, is this uh, color. It's uh, this red orange. You can see the heat map up here, uh, the scale of the heat map. Red and orange is very high liquidity, then yellow, and then white, and then blue, and then black is the least amount. So all we're doing is taking it and plotting it onto the chart, but we record it and we plot it onto the chart historically. So what looks to be really complex with all these different colors and lines is very, very simple. It is the adding and pulling of liquidity. And that's all it is. Uh, so you can see that, uh, well, as the market came down, there was some interesting or interest in buying here. And then they pulled at the last minute. They did not want to buy. Uh, 
Yet we found aggressors uh, uh, with the green dots and buyers, and they started to come, come back up toward areas of high liquidity that they pulled here on the offer and also up here at this um, uh, 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 66 uh, uh, at one dollar and uh, uh, six um, uh, sixty here. Uh, now we can see kind of a small breakout here, uh, back up into this area in this swing here. So anyway, uh, very very simple stuff uh, that we're looking at here. But we have the context of what's going on here in the market. So if we zoom out just a little bit, market was trending down, uh, and then uh, we can see that. Uh, uh, down at the bottom here, we didn't find many sellers. We start to find some buyers, uh, and they're starting to lift it back up and test some of these areas where it came from. Uh, and that's uh, just understanding uh, the structure, the volume within the structure, and also the other side of the trade, the, uh, the, the limit buy and sell orders. Who's, who's taking that or who's not taking that? So if we zoom out and look at the higher uh, time frame picture here, uh, I've got data back to about 6 a.m. Uh, East Coast time. Uh, we can take a look at this context. So here's the market as it's coming down toward this area of high liquidity at 05. Uh, and uh, it traded into it right here. You can see the transactions taking place right into it. And then it traded through it in a big way. Okay, pretty, pretty catastrophic break there. Uh, and it continued on down and tested parity here. Okay, so interesting move into that. And we know, as you can see in the heat map here, see how it's getting kind of red in here? And see how the, that they're, they're kind of bidding in front of this area? This is context. This is showing that, yeah, they're eager buyers in front of that area. They're starting to front run. Uh, and we can understand that behavior. You can also see that buyers started to add in a little bit lower here. They're probably looking for a price to test through it, get filled at a really great price, and then have it test back and maybe through. Uh, the dollar uh, value here. So uh, anyway, the um, uh, that's uh, what what was what unfolded here uh, in the market. We, we can see uh, precisely the behavior here. These guys meant to trade, uh, and they're still here in the current market. Uh, these guys up here at uh, O2, uh, well, they started to come in not too long ago. As the market is coming down, they started to show interest uh, at a higher level here. This is the context. This is where the buyers want to deal. And now we'll see if they, they actually deal when the price comes down like here and trades into it. And this is the, what we want to understand. And this is how you can now look into and see what's going on within the candlesticks. In fact, we can dim the heat map a little bit here uh, and we can look uh, uh, a little bit more uh, closely uh, at the candlesticks and the, uh, uh, the volume and the, and the liquidity. So uh, here's our, our move to the downside. And as, as Dan pointed out, the buying pressure. Okay, so uh, it, uh, this candle closed uh, uh, with, uh, uh, to the downside here, but we found some buyers. Uh, and then off of this low here, well, we start to find more buyers. Uh, and then we break through. Now this level is not really seen too much in the candles. This is an hour uh, candlestick chart, uh, but we can see that uh, uh, this hour here closed at the at this kind of uh, swing uh, and kind of equal low from the previous hour, and then the then the breakthrough. Okay, now look at the breakout, and uh, now it's returning precisely to the area where it broke out from. Okay, so some pretty interesting stuff here. Now in your candlestick, uh, this is looking pretty good to continue lower. Why? Because look at the and this is not a trade recommendation. We're just reading the order flow. Uh, here's why. Well, look at the sellers come in, uh, and uh, we just broke below the swing here. Now, we want to see that selling pressure continue. So let's zoom in here a little bit closer, uh, and let's read the order flow. Uh, let's, let's turn the heat map uh, back up a bit. Uh, and uh, this is good. We see that there's more sellers now at a lower level. Okay. Uh, we're, uh, did we find the sellers down here? Not, not really. Nice selling in here, and it's starting to kind of wane now. Well, maybe we'll get a, a retest back up here, uh, back up into uh, uh, this little kind of uh, a zone or area right here uh, at, at 475, maybe back up to uh, 525. And okay, so now look at the liquidity just coming into the market right now. 
Interesting, interesting move there or interesting phenomena. Uh, a lot of people um, just jumping in um, and uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, dealing here. So uh, now uh, let's let's take a look at that. So we have kind of equal buyers and sellers on either side here. So it's kind of convoluting the picture a little bit here. Uh, we want to read now the context though of this liquidity that came in. So how did the market react to it? Do we find buyers or sellers here? And we haven't really found much yet. Now we're starting to find a little bit of buying or selling here. Okay, all right, sellers, then let's see if you can drop it down to 03 here, uh, or maybe 250 or, or 200 down here. Okay, so we're just uh, looking at the, what's inside this candle and this big move to the downside here uh, on the hourly uh, candlestick chart and below uh, the swing here. We need to see sellers below the swing for continuation and to move away from these previous areas in here. And that's what we're reading in here and trying to read, okay? If we don't get that, we're looking for the retest back here to this liquidity. So you can really start to uh, uh, see what's inside uh, some of the candlesticks and then start to target some of these areas as well. Uh, now you can break this down into a smaller candlestick chart uh, no, no problem. Uh, but um, uh, you know, it's up to you uh, what time frame uh, you're looking at and, and you're trading. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, starting to find some buying interest here. Didn't find too many sellers here. Not enough. So looking actually uh, pretty, pretty good. If we can uh, just see, we're looking for our sellers here. Buyers on the other side. Okay. So uh, let's see if uh, we're seeing quite a bit more buying up here actually. One more test up here and some more buyers, we should get the move or pop into some of this higher liquidity here. And that's the, what we wanna look at here uh, and understand in terms of this context. So is this gonna be a kind of a false breakdown of this area or is it going to uh, accept and go lower? And that's what we're trying to ascertain here by reading in, in the order flow, okay? So anyway, that's the Euro dollar. Uh, and uh, we can jump maybe over to, uh, uh, well, gold was kind of interesting to take a look at here uh, on the way down uh, into uh, or below 1700 uh, and then kind of the move back up uh, after uh, uh, trading down here. Uh, you can start to look at all sorts of different details in here uh, in the order flow. Traded into this liquidity here below uh, the 1700. Uh, we have uh, a 98 on down to uh, 95. This, these guys are getting filled on the bid here. Okay, so lots of selling but someone's on the other side of the trade. In fact, stops and icebergs, we see people getting stopped out and icebergs, uh, they're, they're actually uh, uh, on the other side of that trade as people are getting stopped out and they are buying. Uh, we got a retest here. Uh, we make a slightly uh, higher low. Uh, and uh, now we're, we wanna understand where are the buyers coming in? Where are the sellers? Well, here's, here's buyers above this little drop here. Let's see if we get a bit more and then we should get the move higher into high liquidity and maybe even seven, uh, 1710. There's the move up into 1710. Now I know that's hindsight, uh, but it's the same process uh, that you look at just starting to understand what's making up the candlestick, uh, what's inside of it. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, going, going uh, uh, with that uh, overall uh, higher time frame uh, read. Uh, aided here by the uh, the order flow. So uh, let's let's jump over and take a look maybe at the uh, uh, S and P E mini. Uh, and what candlestick do I have here? And I've got the one hour as well. All right, that's fine. Uh, and um, well, we see the move in the overnight here. Uh, so I have data back to uh, uh, the uh, eight o'clock uh, last night East Coast time. Uh, here's the drop uh, in the European session. Uh, all the way back down into uh, our 9.30 cash open here. Okay? And it continued on, on down to the downside here. But look at the buying coming in here. Okay? Quite a bit of, of aggressive buying coming in. Okay, so you can start to look at that uh, and then look at your candlestick uh, uh, charts as well. Okay? So uh, I look at some of these swings up in here uh, and uh, the buying pressure on some of these wicks in here. And did they get filled? Uh, on the bid. Uh, yeah, they got filled in here, in here, uh, and you can see them kind of nibbling away in here, uh, but um, 
and we're finding buyers all the way through. Now we're finding buyers, but they're not able to lift the market here, not yet. But the buying pressure is really starting to mount. Uh, you can just see it in the color and the size of the dots here compared to the sellers. Uh, so uh, we see have a, who's taking the other side of the trade? Well, the liquidity uh, in these areas here, lots of icebergs too. Right? The hidden orders, they're not gonna be seen in the, uh, in the order book. So, so anyway, uh, the buying pressure mounts uh, here, it breaks it. Uh, and then uh, here's the, the hour uh, candle uh, uh, closes uh, at this point here. Uh, and uh, uh, yet the buying continues. Once we get back up above here on buying, we look for the next area uh, in some of these uh, areas where we previously found selling pressure. And we'd be looking for a test up into those areas. And in this case, uh, the market uh, uh, did exactly that. It came back up into those areas here. So anyway, we're uh, just you know reading uh, and looking at the candles on the higher time frame here, uh, and then understanding what's beyond that though, or what's inside of that, uh, and then that gives us a lot more insight uh, to where price might go next. So uh, I think uh, uh, let me know if you have any questions here. Uh, happy to go through any markets uh, that uh, I have up here. Uh, we've got the, uh, the notes, we've got uh, wheat, uh, we can take a look at wheat or corn. Uh, I've got uh, crude oil here and I've got the NASDAQ as well. Hi Bruce, um, just a quick question from Howard. Uh, looking for some clarification with respect to what the red and blue lines below mean. I think you okay. did explain at the start. Um, but yeah, just... well this, this, isn't, this isn't part of, of Bookmap, this is an add-on. Uh, I, I'm showing it just because like um, uh, it is uh, a pretty pretty powerful and insightful um, uh, thing that uh, uh, the CME offers uh, uh, market by order data. Okay, this is something unique. They've had it for about I think over five years now, uh, uh, but no one's really um, taken too much advantage of it in, 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 until the last uh, few years. Uh, it, it's showing the position in Q. Uh, you can look it up on the CME website and it will show you precisely like, like right now, if we look at uh, this uh, S&P E-mini uh, and we look in here uh, with the current order book, well, these are the number of contracts here. Okay, but we don't know how many orders are in here. So like actually down here, we actually do. Uh, and this is pretty insightful too. Uh, let me show you this. These, these three areas of high liquidity here, well, this little white line here uh, is is indicating uh, that uh, one uh, larger player is holding uh, about you know between a third and half of the liquidity at this price level, and it's most likely the same player because look he's got it on three different levels here. This price level at forty six and a quarter, forty six and forty five and three quarters. So the the white line is equal, likely the same player. Uh, so. Uh, uh, that's basically what the MBO was, uh, or the way that the CME advertises it. However, we're able to extrapolate from that data and the way that the orders come in, we can start to read where uh, people are getting stopped out, uh, as well as where there's hidden orders, uh, not in the, in the order book. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're icebergs. Uh, and that's the whole concept of the iceberg is a larger player doesn't want to show his hand like this guy right here. Uh, so uh, doesn't want to scare price away. Uh, so he wants to get filled without showing uh, how much liquidity he has. Uh, so that's, that's what the uh, sub chart is showing here. We also have it on chart, but I, I turned it off uh, for now. Uh, anyway, it's a very specific thing uh, that uh, uh, it's an add on, like I said, uh, and it is also, uh, you, you will need a, a specific data provider for that uh, as well. There's only one that's uh, offering that. So uh, anyway, it just gives more insight. It's not a signal, um, you know, indicators, the way we look at indicators, they are not signals, they are more influence uh, to reading the order flow. Okay, the order flow, and uh, especially as Dan is going through uh, with the higher time frame and understanding sellers and buyers, and then confirming that in the order flow here. Uh, just as we did here, all of this buying not able to lift it and then finally it starts to break and, and, and nice break here as you guys can see uh, is tested right back down to where it broke from 
uh, as you can see as well. Right. So uh, uh, now we need to see, is it going to accept or reject here? Uh, and that's what we want to read now is the, with this S&P. Uh, a lot of selling starting to come in. Look at the buying coming back, not as many. So this is kind of like a low volume pullback at the moment here. So uh, if we can see, uh, uh, did they get filled here on the offer? Not really. Uh, and uh, I've seen a few more buyers starting to come in right now. All right, well, this, can they pop it up to this 55 area here? Uh, just for, you know, they're starting to pull here at 54. So uh, we just need a few more buyers and we can get a move here to 55. Uh, so just uh, reading the pressures in here, just like this buying wick here, we're reading the pressures here in the, in the order book. And, the, and that's all we're doing. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to get that additional insight. And um, Bruce, another quick uh, question here. Um, can we take a look at Bitcoin? Uh, sure. Um, I don't have it up. And, uh, uh, you know, what exchange? I mean, are you looking at the, the futures? The futures uh, contract, yeah. Okay. And uh, what is the symbol for uh, for Bitcoin? I think it's under BTC. Just BTC. Okay. Yeah, pretty pretty thin, uh, as you can <laughs> see. So not many contracts in here. We're looking at ones, threes, fives, etc. Uh, and not a whole lot of transactions either. So uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is Bitcoin, uh, and um, yeah, you can just see kind of smattering, uh, very very close to the current market here. Uh, so uh, you know, and and a pretty big spread as well because uh, the the thinness of the market. Um, another quick question here, Bruce from uh, from. Denny, uh, will Bookmap provide support for footprint chart or similar to that in the future? Um, a good question. Um, well, potentially, uh, we're always uh, looking at uh, you know uh, developing uh, for whatever uh, people are looking for uh, and whatever helps them uh, in their trading. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, basically, what you're looking at here, though, without the footprint chart. Um, is you're going to get a lot more data or a lot more insight. Footprint charts are great. Uh, however, it still is a bar of aggregated data. So if you're looking at your, um, your bar, uh, there will be very precise volume, but it'll be, you won't see the nuances in here. Uh, you won't see like a, a retest to where it broke from out here, right? Or uh, uh, you know, some sort of a pullback uh, like here. Uh, from where it broke from over here. And look at the selling starting to really pick up here, right? That might be on one bar, uh, all of this activity. Here you have the context though of the structure. Okay, this is back and forth structure. Uh, and then uh, if, you, if <laughs> you can't make a higher high here, uh, you start to see a lot of selling and a selling here at the low. We're looking for you know, price discovery uh, to the downside to previous areas of liquidity. This is a pretty good example here, uh, looking at, uh, at wheat uh, down into the 800 level here. So uh, anyway, that's kind of the, the, the drawbacks um, uh, of uh, a footprint of just the aggregation of the data. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, each chart has its own kind of strengths and, and weaknesses. Uh, you will certainly not get the, uh, 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 the other side of the trade uh, in your footprint chart. Uh, it would be interesting to add it here into Bookmap, though. Uh, we'll have to keep keep uh, have to get back to you on that one in the, in the future. Um, Bruce, uh, we've got some interest in taking a look at. I, I don't know if you've got yesterday's data um, on the heat map for the drop that we saw in the ES or the NQ. I do uh, for the uh, for the ES. Uh, okay. You know, here's the uh, here's the drop. Um, well, I have back. At uh, well, at eight o'clock here. I'm sorry. So uh, uh, we can see the uh, the European session here unfold from two a.m. east east coast time here here in New York, uh, and then the, this drop back down into uh, uh, you know thirty seven twenty five or so. And here it is. I mean, uh, and this is very typical. 
another thing, like uh, just the kind of insights that you can you can ascertain here uh, from order flow. Like you know, as as this is moving lower, these clusters of selling at lower lows into high liquidity. And then you can see how the market kind of bounces out of those areas, retests some of these areas. And look on the other side here. Where's the liquidity? There's not a whole lot. This is very typical in a downtrend. Uh, you'll see this uh, all the time. It's more clusters at the lower lows uh, and very little buying uh, uh, at these uh, uh, swings here that are uh, is basically exhausting out. It's just not finding buyers. Uh, that's when you can start to look at your candles uh, and your wicks, uh, et cetera, uh, starting to understand that, uh, uh, wow, okay, well, we're not getting a whole lot. If we get some sellers below this area here, you know, look for a break. Uh, and look, look again, we're retested here, right to where it broke from. Right? So uh, I, there's a lot of things that you can kind of uh, piece together uh, that, uh, you know, trap traders uh, comes back here and like, oh boy, yeah, I'll sell, no, no problem. Uh, whatever the case may be, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's here uh, in the order flow. You really can't escape it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it will be uh, shown in here. Good stuff. Okay. Do we have any more questions here for Bruce? Well, He's, uh, to my mind, has done an exceptional job of, uh, of explaining Bookmap platform. Um, Bruce, just to clarify, um, we've had a question here regarding uh, GME. Is that, I'm thinking, is that GameStop? I guess GameStop is in, in stocks. I, I don't have any stocks open here. Uh, these are all futures products. But do, uh, do, um, does Bookmark offer the facility for uh, traders to get that data? To yes. It does. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. We, you, you can uh, uh, subscribe to uh, uh, some data feeds for, uh, for stocks, uh, as well as, um, I think, up to 21 different cryptocurrency exchanges that we connect to. Um, Denny, uh, at what point the market makers? Uh, sorry, Denny, your question uh, only, I think only part of it has come through on the chat there. If you want to drop it back in. Uh, no, he uh, hasn't got that. Uh, 21 cryptocurrencies, I think Bruce said there, Jose. Yeah, uh, currency exchanges. Uh, exchanges. So just, just yeah, you just go to bookmap.com and, and connectivity section. You'll you'll see uh, uh, there are many different exchanges that we connect to. Bit different there. The data is is free. They, they're ex you're connecting directly to the exchange, uh, not a data provider or ECM. Uh, but. Uh, uh, with the, the futures market here, for example, I'm connected to Rhythmic right now. You can connect to CQG uh, and uh, a host of others uh, as well. So we connect to uh, many for futures as well. Okay, any more questions for Bruce? <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get to a lot of different things in here. Uh, there's, we're, we're very feature rich. We have a, a lot of different volume columns in here uh, that you can take a look at as well as um, order columns and, and also uh, uh, delta columns, et cetera. There's, there's time and sales, uh, custom notes. Um, there's, there's a lot, uh, but uh, I just wanted to give kind of a, a brief um, overview here. Let's take a look at uh, what happened to our uh, uh, euro dollar here. So it accepted lower. Uh, and uh, we, we, we kind of left off seeing these buyers come in. Uh, and they were able to kind of, uh, as you can see here, kind of lift the market from this consolidation period here, and the buying here that we saw come in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we haven't come back there yet. Uh, so it all, all it did was it was test up and we were kind of looking for that test up of this liquidity up here. Uh, this 450 to 470 area here, uh, which has already already tested. Now, a question is, we we'll kind of uh, reassess the the uh, value here of this instrument. Once again, we've tested up here, 
uh, are we finding more buyers? Well, then where's the next area? Well, high liquidity and also market structure, maybe up here at uh, 560, you know, something like that. And um, Bruce, uh, Ingo asks, could you please do a brief intro into the order column? Uh, the order column. Um, so uh, uh, not sure what- I think he's issue. referring to the, uh, the book uh, uh, in terms of where the liquidity is on the right-hand side, the histogram. Ah, okay. So this one, the current order book? Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, this is basically your dome. Uh, we actually have a, another uh, uh, add-on product that uh, is actually part of, of one of the subscriptions, the Bookmap Global Plus subscription. Uh, and uh, we have a, 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 a DOM that you can uh, uh, access your very professional uh, level DOM here. Uh, so uh, I, I can show you that as well. It's up to you. Uh, you know, you can, you can uh, uh, create a, 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 a configuration here in the columns, or you can access uh, this product here uh, and uh, uh, you know, trade right from the uh, from the DOM if you if you uh, prefer that. So this is a, obviously it's a separate window here. Uh, so you can we have the flexibility uh, to take a look at that as well. So in anyway, this very very simple data in here. It's just uh, these are the contracts at these price levels, and that's that. Uh, these are limit sell orders, and that's all they are, and limit buy orders down below. And interestingly, uh, this is something we discussed uh, before today's session. Um, how you can uh, the visualize spoofing, order spoofing? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and uh, I saw a few nice examples, uh, uh, I think yesterday or maybe a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, the uh, Euro dollar is actually a pretty interesting one because this is so uh, heavily kind of uh, hedged. Uh, you can see the larger players in here uh, at each price level. And you know, it, you can kind of start to understand that, well, this is likely some of the same players in here, the moment that they pull out of these three different price levels, you know, they're, they're kind of adding and pulling in here. And we can start to also, um, when we zoom in, uh, you can start to, let's find a better example, um, start to, to piece together, like, uh, you know, them pulling from, uh, some players pulling from one side and adding to the other, uh, et cetera, like right in here, uh, this liquidity was pulled because it went from first off from uh, high liquidity uh, at, uh, and we can get the number here, um, uh, 49 contracts down to 40, down to this color here, uh, which is uh, 35. Well, they kind of added here on the other side uh, and uh, uh, pulled from here and potentially added over here uh, that went from uh, 21 to 26 to 35. And you'll see this uh, behavior um, again and again and again, uh, like in these areas in here, maybe adding here, pulling down here, uh, et cetera. So you can really start to look at the nuances of the activity of the intention of traders. Do they want to trade at these levels or not? Uh, here, you can see that uh, uh, they wanted to trade. They, they provided that liquidity. And here, here are the transactions taking place right into that liquidity. So these guys got what they wanted. They wanted to be buyers here and they, they bought. Sellers traded into them and the transaction took place. Um, another question here from Danny. At what point market makers will end their liquidity hunting uh, until it hits the very high liquidity zones based on your experience? At what point market makers well, will a lot of times what you'll see, um, and, and, and this is actually a pretty, pretty good one, I think, uh, is, is looking at the currencies. And boy, it's kind of funny we're, we're going over the currencies um, uh, just because uh, we, we typically don't. Uh, most people want to look at the stock indexes, and that's what we cover in our, our education. Uh, but uh, uh, you'll see this behavior, and, and, and you know, each market uh, uh, trades a little bit differently, but the overall um, uh, fundamentals of buying and selling uh, is the same. Uh, there's just different kind of behavior and different kind of players. Uh, and here, for example, uh, you, you'll see that the, well, prices you know starts to come down towards some of these areas and they pull. Price comes back up and they start to pull. That happens typ typically a lot in the uh, in the currencies. 
but then you're looking to see when do they actually stay in uh, the market. So the market makers, when do they want to take the risk? Uh, and then they'll, they'll stay in, in, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the queue uh, and they'll transact. So uh, yeah, that's uh, understanding where they're transacting is really a um, um, pretty, pretty important thing to understand. And then not only where are they transacting, that, that is important, but it's the context after that that's really important. Was there still more selling pressure below these, these transactions here? Or did they absorb all of that selling pressure uh, and, then, and then price, there was no more sellers? There's, there's still more buyers, but there's no more sellers. Well, price is going to revert back into areas uh, where they can find uh, other sellers here on the offer, right? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, this, this, there was a little bit more selling pressure. It traded through, but look, look how the buyers start to come in. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, once we start to see that, we kind of look for some of these other areas up here at maybe 440 or 470 to uh, uh, potentially uh, transact. Okay, in this case, it just kind of came up to this liquidity here, still testing up to that liquidity there. Uh, and uh, yeah, then finally we got the move here uh, back up into that swing. And that's kind of what we we're looking at uh, in the live market. Excellent. Um, how could be the best way to find out the next movement of the market? Talking about probabilities, I can see liquidity at both sides of the chart. So I guess Ricardo is trying to ask how, from a uh, trading perspective, he will be best able to identify the next directional move. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, it's, it's really understanding that context in here. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the, these three elements here, uh, but understanding like, well, okay, look at, look at the reaction here to this liquidity here. Are we finding buyers? Yeah, starting to. So maybe if, if, if they show high liquidity in here, now they just pulled it though, right? Uh, but if they mean to, to trade and they stay in here and we find buyers, that's the context we're looking for this liquidity up here to test or some, you know, or very close to it. Uh, and uh, that's where you start to understand it. And again, like it, we're going through a process in here, uh, but this is actually very simple stuff. Uh, is we're talking about auction uh, and auction market theory. Basically, this is no different than going to the farmers market. Uh, that uh, you know, where where is the, where are the sellers? Well, they're over here, the majority of them. Well, do we find buyers wanting to trade with these sellers? Well, then they're going to charge up toward it. Uh, and uh, do these guys actually stay in the order book? Do they fill? Uh, so it's, uh, it's this context uh, that we want to understand uh, uh, between these elements in here. So here, you know, we traded up into this uh, uh, 480 level or 475, uh, more buying above it. Uh, and then uh, that was it. Uh, th these guys are actually going to be kind of trapped here. Uh, and uh, uh, we see that the uh, sellers, see how sellers are kind of uh, they came in below that area here and this, this cluster of buyers. And to put the squeeze on, uh, you know, these, these guys that bought up here are going to feel the pinch uh, if, uh, if, if you get enough sellers to trade back down at some of the lows here. You can see who's winning the battle here right now. Okay? So buyers are. Uh, we saw that this is, this is basically like a spoof right in here. Uh, it's not, we don't really know, uh, uh, but uh, their intent, though, was they came in, they skewed the auction, and we found some buyers, a few, and then they pulled. So they didn't take any risk. Uh, they didn't really transact. Now they did, right here. And we're getting more buyers above it. So let's see, let's see if we can get back up to 520, maybe even 560. We were looking at 560. I think we outlined that earlier. Uh, yeah, here, where it broke from here. Okay. So... Uh, uh, there, there's your context, and that's how to kind of put these pieces together. Okay, another question. Uh, will Bookmatch show resting stop losses for the E-mini futures? I think you covered that before with the icebergs, and that's an additional add-on, yeah. is it? Um, well, yeah, not. we don't know where stops are resting, um, but we know when they transact. Uh, so... Uh, uh, yeah, I can I can show you that. It might be better to take a look at the uh, S and P E mini on uh, on that or the Nasdaq. 
uh, there's just you know quite a bit more depth and a lot more transactions. Uh, but uh, yeah, in fact, let me turn on the uh, uh, the on chart uh, indicator here uh, for stops in the icebergs, uh, and uh, you can take a look at uh, some of the details in here. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by it, uh, to be honest, and uh, it it never gets uh, tiresome. Um, so uh, just just loading right now, uh, and uh, let's take a look. So there's actually an iceberg. Oh, just disappeared. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, and then we'll take a look at a stop run in here. Uh, in fact, let's take this. Let's take the icebergs off for a moment here. Uh, and uh, we'll take a look at, uh, yeah, okay. So here was a stop run of 134 contracts up here. Well, this is what it looks like. And this is what happens uh, uh, in the market. And we're just, th this is the beauty of what I think Bookmap is displaying, is it's simply displaying what unfolded. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, it's giving you the, the truth of what's behind uh, some of these moves. So this is aggressor behavior in here, uh, lifting the offer. Okay, and uh, you know we're looking at uh, you know uh, microseconds in here. So um, you know this this move here, it looks like it might be uh, uh, you know something uh, lost data or, or something. It is not. It is uh, uh, basically a one event, an atomic event that took place and unfolded, and then. Best didn't offer update after that. So you have a kind of a chain of events that happen when you get down into these sub-second levels. So here, uh, buyer came in, it could have, they could have been squeezed out. Uh, we don't know, uh, but um, we know that there was a lot of buying in here. Along the way in this big move to the upside here, stops are triggered. But this one player uh, has not, his order has not gotten filled yet. His order, is basically filled up here. And this red line in here is showing when stops are now starting to transact. Okay, so along the way, as this one event unfolded, stops are triggered. And we don't know where exactly, uh, but we know when they're transacting. And when you get slipped and your, your stop gets slipped, this is what this is exactly what was happening. So you can see precisely. Uh, where the stops start to transact, and they actually lift the market uh, a tick or two in here as well, one tick. Okay. I don't know if that uh, have any questions on that or if that. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think that's covered it off. Uh, okay. Bingo replies, "What a buy sweep." <laughs> yeah, this is this is a buy sweep. Uh, we have a we are, we do have a, a sweeps uh, indicator that will also show these areas on the chart, uh, and uh, we also have an absorption indicator as well. Uh, there, those are all part of the Global Plus uh, subscription package. Uh, all these kind of add-on indicators. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you can get that with that 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 subscription type. Um. Okay, I'm just cognizant of the time here. We're running uh, close to an hour and a half. And uh, I don't know if Dan has got any additional commitments that uh, I need, we need to think about wrapping things up here. Does anyone else have any questions either for Bruce or for Dan? Can't see any additional questions coming through. What I'd just briefly like to do for everyone, um, I'm going to take uh, control of the screen here now and uh, and discuss the offer I mentioned at the uh, the beginning of the session that Tickmill are providing to clients. Uh, essentially, what Tickmill are uh, giving you is that if you sign up for a futures trading account, and on the screen there. You can see a screenshot of the. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Patrick, I don't see your screen. Can't see it. Uh, yeah. There we go. You should be able to see it now. Okay, great. So, um, Tickmill are offering a essentially a six month uh, complimentary subscription to the Bookmark Global Plus package that Bruce has been discussing. That gives you those additional indicators and tools. Uh, I think Bookmark charged about ninety nine dollars a month for that subscription. So. Uh, Tickmill will provide you with that for six months for free. 
uh, if you have a funded trading account with Ticknell, I'm going to put a link into the chat here, uh, which is this subscription sign up. But just a, a quick note, Patrick, on that the the stops and icebergs are not included in in the global not plus in the global plus. Okay. That's correct. But the sweeps and absorption certainly is. Excellent. Okay, so once you sign up and you've uh, you've funded your account, the minimum um, funding requirement is a thousand US dollars. You'll then have access to your subscriptions, and you can see here that uh, we have the bookmap subscription. You simply uh, sign up for that. You do have to pay a, a $10 connection fee. That just gives you the CQG uh, data feed that, uh, that uh, Bookmap support. And then you will have, uh, you'll have your access all set up. And like we say, you, uh, as long as you maintain that funded account for the six month period, you will have full complimentary access to the Bookmap platform. Um, and Bruce, just, uh, just one other que quick question. Uh, do uh, Bookmap provide uh, a training videos for for the for the service? Oh yeah, we we have um, um, hundreds of, of videos basically, but uh, 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 you know some of the uh, are, are more kind of onboarding of of, of kind of uh, going through uh, you know some of these elements, how, how to read them, uh, and then all the different features and components. Uh, and uh, we also have daily webinars. Uh, that go through uh, reading the uh, live market uh, order flow. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, with that said, and uh, hopefully everyone understands the offer there, if there are any questions, uh, you can reach out to me via my email and I'll happily point you in the right direction. Um, Dan, any other input from you at this stage? No, it was great to be with everyone today. I hope you've gotten a few ideas from what I discussed that may give you some insights and Bruce, great to be with you. Patrick, also always terrific to be with you. And I look forward to our paths crossing again in the future. Excellent. In the meantime, I wish everyone much success with their trading. Brilliant, thanks, Dan. Uh, Bruce, final thoughts from you? No, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, no, a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I too look forward to crossing paths again in the future. Excellent. Okay, with that said then, I am going to wrap up the session. Like I say, if you've got any questions regarding the offer or anything that's been discussed this evening, feel free to reach out to me on email. And like I say, I'll point you in the right direction. So thank you very much everyone for attending tonight's event. I hope you've got some uh, actionable ideas to take away from this and I hope that you will join us at Tickmill and take advantage of the, uh, the book map offer. Thank you very much and best of luck with your trading. <laughs>